the wildlife of Harvergate Marshes, uh, in spring. So this is me with, uh, with a purple emperor butterfly looking rather pleased about it. So my name's Carl Chapman and I've been running a wildlife uh, or been running wildlife tours and education, should I say, based in Norfolk since 2008, so 14, 15 years now. And each month we do trips throughout Norfolk, uh, spotting wildlife. And also once each month we go somewhere else in the country, um, perhaps staying in a hotel or whatever. And uh, that can be anywhere from John O'Groats to the Isles of Scilly, really. Uh, and that's where I'm going next week, the Isles of Scilly. So <clears throat> I, uh, when I first set the company up, there was an awful lot of uh, people that came on the tours and brought a, a camera with them. And uh, very, very few of them knew how to really use it. So I had a diploma in photography and started to use that to teach wildlife photography. So all the photographs that are displayed today are mine. And if you want to look at some of more of my photographs, there's a site called Wild Catch Photography, where you can have a browse through uh, some of the photographs that I've taken in the past. So uh, <clears throat> I am also a mentor for AFN, a focus on nature. Uh, this is an organization for 15 to 25 year olds, and it helps them get employment in conservation and wildlife. So if you've got any young people in your family that are wanting to uh, 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 venture into the world of wildlife, I recommend that they have a look at the AFON website. Now, <clears throat> I uh, chaired or chair the Liaison Committee of the Norfolk and Norwich Naturalist Society. This is an organisation that's uh, been around for more than 150 years now. And the Liaison uh, Committee looks at planning issues throughout the county that affect wildlife and gives advice in relation to those, uh, those planning issues. So I did used to uh, chair the actual society itself, but uh, I gave that up after about four years to let somebody else sort of sit in the chair for a while. And uh, the liaison committee is, uh, keeps me more than occupied, believe me. Um, <clears throat> as well as that, I'm also a Norfolk Cetacean Recorder. Uh, there's uh, all the dolphins, whales and porpoise that are seen offshore. I try to get to know about and record them, uh, how long they've been here, where they are, what they're doing and so on. And also um, one of the founding directors of a company called McNag Marine Conservation for Norfolk Action Group, uh, which has been running just over a year now. And that is l sort of looking at um, the protection of the wildlife that's just off our shores. So hopefully that does some good. As do the um, British Divers Marine Life Rescue. I'm a marine mammal medic with them. Um, they usually wheel me out to um, to sort of talk to TV or radio uh, whenever there's a beach whale or whatever. I uh, very rarely get involved in rolling about the surf uh, with seals these days, but there you go. That's what age does for you. Um, and I'm also the regional coordinator for Sea-Watch Foundation. So um, basically Sea-Watch Foundation monitors cetacean activity and lobbies government to protect areas where they're found. So it's a uh, very well, well worth organization. They do some great uh, updates and so on. If you wanted to uh, look through their website, please do. Uh, but however, I'm principally an ornithologist. That's my first love. This is a, a nice female marsh harrier. You can see the, the sort of uh, across the wing there, there's some 
lighter areas. Um, I'm not sure if I can point them out, if you can see my cursor there, but that uh, those areas there that indicate that this is a very young bird. So marsh area. So <clears throat> what we're going to do uh, this evening is is really sort of take a look at what we might see out on the marshes on Sunday and uh, we can we can kick off with uh, um, the mammals uh, then move on to dragonflies um, butterflies and the birds so we're going to kick off with one, something that we've seen previously which is uh, a muntjac this is a new photograph uh, that I've recently taken of uh, a muntjac this is a nice male uh, they are the ugliest deer that you could wish to see. Uh, I'm sure many of you, many of uh, you, get them in their gardens. The uh, the local uh, publican near where we live here, uh, up in uh, up in West Runton, has a problem with muntjac coming in and eating all his flower beds. So uh, a little tip for you is hung carbolic soap all around the uh, all around the gateway and that's uh, managing to keep them out apparently so um, you'll notice that uh, just underneath the eye on this animal there are some bumps these are actually scent glands and they will s spread uh, a secretion that comes out of those glands onto trees and foliage so that other muntjac know that they're around uh, they use them for uh, marking the territory. You can see them, see them here. And I guess that's what uh, turns it from being in a, a Bambi into quite a, quite a, um, a face that only a mother could love, really. Uh, the females are a little bit cuter, although they've still got those uh, sort of scent glands there. Um, but uh, but basically they're they're. Uh, just that little bit, a uh, little bit cuter. They can, the females particularly, can lead to confusion with a deer that we've seen on the marsh previously, uh, and that's this deer. Uh, in fact, on the previous, uh, the previous walks that we've done there, we've we've always seen them, and that's Chinese water deer. A lot cuter, a lot more benign. <clears throat> Equally as active, they're, they're a sort of sprightly deer. Um, more often in the open, out on the uh, out on the fields. And uh, just recently, I took this picture, uh, and you can quite easily see the tusks. Um, they're not. They're not. I was pulled up actually for sort of stating that re they're retractable. They're not retractable, but they can fall down into the guns so they can't retract the things um, but they can sort of fold them down a little bit into the guns and they they're used for fighting and again we've covered before that they were uh, an introduced species uh, from uh, from asia another um, species that we will see i'm sure on sunday is the hare just recently um, a disease called RHD, uh, which is rabbit hemorrhagical disease, hemorrhagic disease, um, was uh, well first reported in rabbits, uh, in domestic farm rabbits actually, in 1984, and it's killed about four million animals since. Um, but uh, RH2. Uh, which has moved in from the continent, has now made the leap from rabbits, unfortunately, to hares. So uh, we look as though we might, this is a similar disease to uh, to what rabbits endured with myxomatosis. So it's something that, uh, that we don't really want, but unfortunately, um, viruses do uh, take a toll these days on everything. So a beautiful animal 
the hairs. This is a photograph I, I took uh, uh, three or four weeks ago. Um, and it, uh, my wife says that this individual looks as though it's, she's had a nose in a mother's makeup bag. There's a bit of a line across it. I think that's maybe some sort of uh, water staining or the like. But uh, very, very beautiful animals, very enigmatic. Another quite secretive animal is this chap. Uh, we've not seen them on a tour as yet, but I'm very, very hopeful that we're going to see them as we walk down onto the marshes. We'll be checking the dishes, uh, ditches for them. This is a water bowl. Um, <clears throat> I would expect them to be there. Uh, you usually see them swimming about uh, in the ditches. And you can expect to see them. You can see that little arched back there. That's quite typical of the pores as you see them sort of scuttling across the, the water's top. Um, but you not only see them in the water, they're, they're quite arboreal as well. Uh, not many people realise that they uh, where, where foliage overhangs ditches, you can sometimes find them sort of climbing up the foliage to uh, to get to one or two leaves. I saw some at the back end of last year eating uh, eating blackberries. They climbed up into a tree to eat blackberries. This one's just chomping its way through some uh, some leaves, but uh, more often than not, they're eating. Uh, reeds and uh, you can sort of see them sort of chomp chomp down as they hold the reed between the front two feet and they'll chomp down on reeds but again it's something that I would have hoped we would have seen. Andrew's seen otter out on the river um, by the marsh uh, and he, he did I think he either filmed it or photographed it. I can't can't remember which, but uh, I seem to remember him showing it me sometime in the past. So they are about. They're on every river system in Norfolk now. And uh, it wouldn't be untenable for us to, to come across uh, an otter as we walked out on the marsh. Sometimes they're a long, long way from water. It's surprising. Uh, but there's plenty of water for them to, uh, to occupy. This one's a female. I don't know whether you can notice that the, there's a, a uh, it's got a pink nose. Can you see that? Um, the, the females quite often get their noses bit by the males and uh, they end up with these sort of pink scabs on the noses. This is uh, one otter that I photographed with a pike that it had caught. And it, uh, the pike was almost, not, not quite, but almost as long as the otter. OK, so. Moving on to Ordinata, on to dragonflies. This is the uh, the earliest damselfly that we get. Comes out um, right from sort of uh, the end of April, really, uh, through May and into June. And this is a large red damselfly. It's quite beautiful, and it is quite large as damselflies go. And any sort of water, ditches, uh, and the like will undoubtedly uh, contain the odd large red damselfly. So this is something that, uh, that we'll be keeping our eyes open for on Sunday. Um, one of the earliest dragonflies to come out is this one. This is a hairy dragonfly and the thorax is covered in small hairs. You can perhaps see them on on that photograph, but I'll sort of give you a close up of that so that you can see them there. And it's thought that they, uh, the hairs are there to protect it from from the sort of cold earlier on in the year. Maybe the the odd frost that we get through uh, through 
the back end of April and beginning of May. So, um, hairy dragonfly. Again, they have been seen out on Havergate marshes, so we'll be keeping our eyes open for, for those. And we've had some, some a little bit of warm weather recently. Um, so there are one or two other dragonflies on the on the wing as well, which uh, I've not covered in here. But uh, given that it's been so warm of late, I'm sure there's been uh, we'll see one or two others too. So we'll keep our eyes open for those. Um, I slipped this one in just at the last minute. This is a uh, hairy footed flower bee. So again, it's one of the. You can see why it's called hairy footed. It's got these little sort of hairy pads on the end of the feet there. And it's one of the earliest bees around. So we might just uh, we might just see one or two of these around uh, with a little bit of luck. Any odd flowers that are around, uh, they might be uh, attracted to them. But they are a beautiful little bee. Quite nice, quite cute. And well, we, we talk in insects, and I'd like you to keep an eye open uh, for these guys. This is a red-veined darter. Now, they're not common, um, but they do occur. They come in from the continent, and given the, the southerly wind that we've got at the moment, I, I would suggest to you that it's, it's an in, uh, very possible that we could get one of these now it's got you can perhaps see that at the base of the wings there's this orangey red color and that's where it gets the name red vein data but the simplest identification feature for this is that eye you can see i'm going to close up for you here you can see that it's got this sort of two-tone eye with the red up above and the blue down below so it's half red, half blue eye, uh, quite distinctive. You can pick that up through a pair of binoculars at quite a distance. So red vein data, keep your eyes open for those. If you do see any, um, maybe we'll see some on Sunday, who knows? But if you, uh, if you do see any anywhere, please let me know. I'd be very, very interested. Um, <clears throat> I got notification from some friends on the Isles of Scilly last week that the back end of last week that they had uh, a small invasion of of these butterflies and that's a painted lady uh, these butterflies come up each year from the nile valley and they make their way up through europe uh, and then into the UK and have been known to reach as far north as Iceland. And what happens is they uh, they basically migrate and um, breed on their way. And subsequent ones migrate, the, the young migrate along with them. And it looks like being with the numbers that are on the Isles of Scilly. And also yesterday some were seen on the north. Norfolk coast. Um, I think somebody had about 30 of these flying past them while they were bird watching. Uh, so it looks like being another painted lady year. So we'll see how manic it gets with these things. I have seen them in big drifts uh, so that they're the commonest butterfly you see. And in painted lady years, um, we do get a, a massive influx of them. So, a couple of butterflies that are already on the wing, already had these, that's a red admiral on the left and a small tortoise shell on the right. Um, so what uh, we, we sh again, we should see some of these on the wing. The weather forecast for Sunday is looking good. So again we should be uh, we should be walking very slow so we can pick up on all the insects that we see including peacock on the left and a comma on the right you can see that little comma mark on the underwing there 
and a butterfly that's uh, quite underrated really until you see it very very close and that's the green veined white you can see those veins in the uh, the underside of the wing it's not as marked on the upper side so you you have to wait until it settles to be really sure of your identification One of the first butterflies that we get on the wing each year are these. This is a brimstone butterfly. And again, these were on the wing right at the end of, uh, of March. I had my first one. So they've been all the way through April and we, we've got them in May as well. Last weekend, uh, we, uh, we were sort of following a couple round. Uh, so that photographers could uh, take some pictures of them, but quite a, quite a beautiful butterfly. They, this sort of uh, buttery yellow uh, colour to them on the upper side, with this greenish colour on the underside. And if they land in a tree, you've lost them. You can't you can't see it amongst new foliage, but they've got this distinctive uh, tail on the wing that you can see there. That spot on the underside of the wing as well helps to identify them. So that's brimstone butterfly. Andrew, uh, we'll move on to birds now. Andrew mentioned uh, cranes. I've been expecting to uh, to see cranes. I expected to see them on the winter visit, to be honest with you. Um, and uh, after I left everybody uh, and we'd all gone home, I'd gone about two or three miles down the road and I actually uh, found a, a flock at the roadside of cranes. I think there was about 22 of them. One of them had a, um, I think it's a Norwegian ring on it. So uh, they are around. Uh, they've split up now. They're not in the large flocks. They're, they're breeding, but who knows? We might uh, see one fly over or we could see one out on the marsh, pair out on the marsh. And of course, Younger birds won't be breeding, so they're still sort of in these, uh, how can we put it, bachelor uh, singleton flocks, if you like, bachelor flocks. So they've been around in the UK in, in sort of um, reasonable numbers since 1969. There's a, there was a, a massive migration of birds uh, into the UK they were they were originally a, a UK breeding bird in the in the 1600s, but they were shot out of existence. Apparently, the meat tastes quite good, so they uh, they were hunted to extinction in 1969. Quite a a large number came up through the UK because these birds migrate from North Africa up to Scandinavia each year. And six uh, through this, the few hundred that came through the UK that year six stopped at Horsey and ever since then numbers have built up and built up and, and also uh, numbers have uh, been reintroduced into certain areas down on the Somerset levels and so on. So there's around about <clears throat> um, between two and three hundred birds in the UK now. Uh, so we've got a, a fair chance to see them, a fair chance to see them. On the ditches, um, <clears throat> this is a, a different looking bird to the winter plumaged little grebes that we were uh, we were sort of looking at during the winter visit. Uh, in the ditches, it's got this uh, beautiful chestnut throat and cheek. Uh, it's still got the stumpy sawn off rear end, uh, but it's got this uh, nice luminescent spot at the base of the bill. Now, it's not documented anywhere, uh, and it's pure hypothesis on my part, but I suspect that that luminescent spot, it's got the same sort of um, same sort of characters as the old watches with the luminescent dials, and um, maybe, maybe it's used to attract fish underwater. Who knows? Seen many times out on the marsh, grey heron. <clears throat> quite distinctive in flight with that black trailing edge to the wing. And I photographed this bird, I thought I'd push, pop this photograph in 
for you to have a look at, instantly you would think to yourself that this is an egret. Uh, it even has a, a bright yellow bill, like a great white egret. Uh, but look at the leg colour and also the structure of the head and the body itself is all wrong for great white egret. In fact, this is a, a, it's not an albino, but it's got a leucristic. So it's lost a lot of its colour and it's a grey heron. So <clears throat> these, these things do exist and from time to time you get thrown by them. Uh, but uh, it was initially reported as a great white egret. Now this, uh, these are great white egrets, they're now breeding in Norfolk. And uh, you can see the <clears throat> dark legs there and the yellow bill. And this is uh, another bird that's taken advantage of the northward uh, movement of the temperature contour. So with uh, climate change, as things start to, uh, as the temperature starts to move north, then these birds have moved up from the uh, from the Mediterranean and are now breeding here in some number. It's not. It would be an odd day now if I didn't go out on a tour and didn't see a, a great white egret. Lick leaderets have uh, have been around for a while now, um, and we've we've covered them before in these uh, in these talks. But uh, still nice to see. Still nice to see a bit of variety, and in spring particularly, they can get a plumage um, that that really adorns them like a feather coat, really. And you can see from this photograph that they are spectacularly beautiful birds, despite being rather common now. So if we uh, if we move now onto the uh, the geese or the wildfowl, should I say, this is um, this is a bird that occupies the marsh. This is a grey lag goose with young, as you can see all huddled up there um, and undoubtedly we'll we'll see those on Sunday I'd be disappointed if we didn't and on the last two tours we've also seen Egyptian goose as well and they may now have uh, have young um, this was taken uh, just last week so uh, there'll be a few little uh, little goslings running around I'm sure it's that time of the year. Uh, the uh, I'd be again surprised if we didn't see a marsh harrier. This is a male with the tricolored wings, the brown, grey, and black wings. Ray, it flies on raised wings, so you can uh, you can see them sort of flying across the marsh. Very similar to a buzzard at distance because of the raised wings, but a lot slimmer, longer tailed, narrower winged. So it's the structure of the bird that you initially should look at if you see a large raptor, a large bird of prey on raised wings. Structure of the bird initially, but the colour in there is, uh, is an obvious male, unlike the female that we saw before. Another bird of prey that seems to have taken a hold now thankfully, is red kite. That tail, that identification uh, is easily obtained by that fork tail. The, uh, in the 90s, I think it was the, yeah, it would have been the 90s, the early 90s, the first pair bred in Norfolk. And that was a one bird from one of the reintroduction schemes and a wild bird, which uh, they, they thought was from Spain. Um, and that was uh, on the coast, not too far away from Hothergate Marshes. Uh, now, because of the reintroductions uh, that have occurred in places like the M25, around the M25, uh, in Yorkshire, in Northumberland, 
uh, in Scotland and so on, then yeah, they're not difficult to find at all. In fact, I get a regular passage over the house here up in West Runton almost on a daily basis now. And they are spectacular birds. People sometimes ask me why they're called red kites, and you can see there the uh, the upper surface of the tail is is quite red. That's where they get the name. And I photographed this just this uh, last couple of months, actually, this particular one, and uh, that uh, was stooping down at some prey, and you can see how red the tail is there. Already mentioned buzzard, and uh, this is uh, this is a sort of typical uh, what you would see. I've only shown you in flight previously. Perch raptors are difficult to separate sometimes, but uh, you can see here from this uh, photograph that uh, it has this white gorget. Around the uh, round the breast and uh, unfeathered tarsi, unfeathered legs, you can see down there. Now I pop this photograph in. Um, this is a, a white-tailed eagle. And I took some people out last Saturday. Uh, beg pardon last Sunday along the um, along the uh, North Norfolk on East Bank at Cly. Some of you will know it. And as we were walking out there, everything and its grandmother got up in the air, uh, frightened to death. Everything was panicking. And I said to the group, either look for an osprey or look for an eagle. And uh, we didn't have to look actually. This thing flew just feet above our head and it's an immature white-tailed eagle uh, in fact if it had been any closer we could have, we could have ridden it they um, basically it's a um, white-tailed eagle was reintroduced back into the UK after it had been shot out of existence well well back um, in Victorian times and it was uh, it, it was reintroduced into Mull. Subsequently, there have been reintroductions in eastern Scotland and eastern Southern Ireland. And uh, also now on the Isle of Wight. Now, big birds of prey, when they're introduced into an area, they tend to go and walk about <clears throat> when, when they first uh, are released. And then they come back to their uh, natal area to breed subsequently. So these uh, birds that were released onto uh, the Isle of Wight have gone as far as France and Germany. They, they're radio tagged so that they can be followed. Uh, birds have gone as far north as Yorkshire, uh, Lancashire. Uh, they've been down into Dorset. Uh, but at the moment, we've got two of them riding about Norfolk somewhere. We'd be very, very lucky to see them on Sunday. But hey ho, you know, a couple of weeks running. Who knows? One might fly over us. Let's hope it does. The uh, the the sort of uh, wing tags. I'll go back there. The wing tags on these birds um, are. They're very difficult to handle. The one of the guys that uh, I've been doing a little bit of work at, at Wild Ken Hill, and one of the uh, one of the guys that used to work there is one of the few ringers in the UK that's licensed to ring white-tailed eagles and tag them. And he did a few of the a few of the Isle of Wight birds. And he described it as like trying to manage uh, a 15 year old having a tantrum carrying steak knives. Uh, those talons are really lethal weapons. 
and w at least one person uh, who was handling these uh, these birds as not the Iowa birds I stress uh, has actually lost their life through uh, those talons entering a uh, a major artery. So uh, it's not an easy thing to do to uh, to get these uh, radio collars on these birds and get them wing tagged and everything. So two birds that we've uh, we've come across before. Uh, the small raptors. Uh, if you uh, the bird on the left is a is a kestrel and that's a male kestrel with a grey head and a grey tail, black band on the end of the tail. And it's got this two tone upper wing. So you've got the, the black outer primary feathers and then you've got the, the inner feathers and all this chestnut colours, beautiful chestnut colour. So quite easy to tell at a distance from the sparrowhawk that has a concolorous upper wing. So that's completely uh, one colour. You can see that this bird sat on a hapless red, red wing, unfortunately. But uh, very, very easy to... Uh, to tell kestrel at a distance if it's not hovering. Uh, once it starts to hover, you know what you've got. But uh, very, very easy to tell because of this two-tone upper wing. Hobby, Merlin, Peregrine, Sparrowhawk, all have this concolorous upper wing. Lapwing. Again, we saw these on the last visit. These birds will now uh, be nesting. There will be some nesting out there on the marsh. Um, the crest itself, you can sex them at a distance. The crest is, is longer in males and the, the breast band is darker, there's less browning. And uh, I think I previously mentioned to you on, on a talk that, uh, that they used to be called green plover because of that green feathering on the mantle there. Old English name for them, green plover. And again in winter, but in winter plumage, we saw these birds. Um, these are golden plover, and we saw a flock on the winter walk. Uh, these are now moving north back to either the Yorkshire Moors or the Pennines or Scotland or even uh, Scandinavia to breed. And you can see that this bird has black all the way up onto the face, up from the belly onto the face, which is absent in the winter plumage, they're pale underneath. <clears throat> but the amount of black on the birds dictates where they're from. So the more black they've got on them, the, they're from the far north. So this bird is a Scandinavian bird. Erlu. Red data species now curlew. There will be one or two, but not many. There's a, a scheme being run at uh, over at Wild Ken Hill uh, called the Head Start Scheme, where to try and put some of these curlews back into the wild, the eggs are taken off aerodromes and airfields where they the nests and eggs will get mown out. Uh, and they're reared in cages and then released onto the marsh when they're able, when they're old enough. And at least, um, although it's not tackling the reason why the birds have declined, at least it's giving them a head start. So that's uh, that's effectively what uh, what that is. Nice curve, bubbling bubbling call. I'm sure you've heard it, but. Uh, it's still a beautiful bird. And this is a bird that uh, that nests out on the marsh. And I'm going to, this is a snipe, and I'm going to attempt now to uh, play you the drumming call. Can you hear that, Andrew? I can't hear that, I'm afraid, Carl. Plan, okay. plan B. Plan B, okay. Right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play this on my phone for you. Now that, uh, that noise 
is uh, is described um, as the drumming of the snipe. Uh, and basically it's not made by, um, it's not a, a vocal sound that's made by the bird, but what it does is it flies around its territory in a big, big wide circle. And it climbs and then descends all the way around the circle. And on the descent, it spreads its outer two tail feathers outwards. And it's the sound of the air traveling over those feathers that makes that drumming sound. So again, if we're lucky, we might hear a drumming snipe on the marshes at Havergate. They do that sort of display flight to, uh, to sort of uh, hold territory, uh, attract a mate and so on, but it's not a vocal sound at all. It's the spreading of the outer two tail feathers. And you can, as a kid, I used to emulate this with a, uh, a rubber bung and get two feathers and put it in and put the bung on a, on a piece of string and swing it, round, <laughs> swing it round my head. And you could make a very, very similar sound to the, uh, the drumming sound of the snipe. So this is the bird that got me into bird watching as a very young boy, as a five, four, five year old. Uh, I was just fascinated by the fact that it didn't make that sound. It took me ages to find it um, because they uh, they quite fly quite high when they're doing it, uh, and I could hear this sound like a discharge of electricity. Couldn't work out what it was, and eventually sort of pinned it down to this bird. And when you use binoculars, you can actually see as the the bird descends and falls, you can see the outer two tail feathers through the binoculars. Really is good. We. Uh, we saw these birds in some numbers. These are black-tailed godwits. Uh, we saw them in some number in winter, uh, but now they're summering up for the return north. So hopefully there'll still be one or two around and they've got this lovely chestnut plumage uh, that we can see here. Black-tailed godwit. I'm sure we will, uh, we'll see black-headed gulls. <clears throat> Now in uh, the summer plumage with a lovely black head, which isn't black at all, actually, it's brown. But they've got this um, white leading edge to the outer wing. And there's no other gull other than, save one that's very, very rare to occur here in the whole of Europe that has that, uh, has that white leading edge. So you can tell black-headed gulls from quite a long way away. A new kid on the block is uh, is this guy. Now, if you look at the wings there, they're completely all white. This is a Mediterranean gull. And again, when I was a lad, you used to have to travel down into the toe of Kent to see these. Uh, but since uh, temperature increases, and again, and as it gradually contours move north, we're getting more and more birds from the continent. Um, although we're losing a few too. Uh, but uh, you can see that the the head is jet black on that, and it's got this uh, this eyeliner that it wears with this deep red droopy bill, and it's uh, it's also got a very very distinctive call, uh, which a, a good friend of mine always describes as a pantomime dame. So it's a chill chill uh, call. So it's uh, it is quite a uh, quite an amusing bird, almost comical really. Birds that will be breeding now in some of the old mills, um, uh, stock doves here all year. No white on the neck, that beautiful iridescent green patch. Another bird that's with us all year, uh, but will be singing out on the marsh is the skylark. It will sing from a perch too. So we can get a good look at one if we find one singing on a clod of earth or on a fence post or whatever. And uh, birds that have recently come back from Africa. Uh, first of all, sand martin. We hopefully will see one or two of those. We'll certainly see 
uh, swallows and uh, maybe even house martins as well. The uh, sand martins normally come back first, then the swallows, then the house martins. Uh, and then finally we get the swifts and they came back certainly here on the coast. They came back about four or five days ago and we've had them in good numbers and some not only passage birds moving further north, but also the village birds are back here. So I would expect to see one or two of these flying high around the church or whatever. And then Medipipit. Again, we saw Medipipit on the marsh. We heard it. We didn't have a good look at it because it was away before before we uh, we could get onto it in the on the winter walk, but uh, they will undoubtedly be one or two breeding birds out there, I'm sure. So we we should be able to pick those up. And also stone chat as well. This is a nice male. See that with a nice white collar and the uh, the red chest, black head. Uh, whereas the female is perhaps a little bit drabber, dare I say, um, but still the same dumpy shape, a chat, chat shape. And these are two birds that uh, people often get mixed up when they hear them. Uh, once you see them, you can quite easily sort them out. The bird on the left is a sedge warbler with that supercilium, that pale eyebrow that you can see on it which is lacking in the bird on the right, which is a reed warbler. But they do sound very, very similar. And hopefully we'll be able to separate those two out. Sure, there'll be one or two on the marsh. Another warbler uh, that we will see and hear, beautiful song, the black cap. This is a nice male. <clears throat> Female has a brown cap. The male always looks to me like he's dressed for dinner. Lovely bird. And another warbler, chiff chaff. I'm sure we'll hear one of those. I'm sure you're familiar with it. I'm sure we'll uh, we'll hear one of those in the trees before we get onto the marsh. Disappointed if we don't. And we should have one or two other birds around as well. Uh, goldfinch. which will uh, will be nesting now. So if we follow birds feeding and see where they're carrying their food back to, we should be able to sort of locate where they're breeding. And also, likewise, to finish off, reed bunting, the vicar of the reed bed with that uh, white collar around the neck there. Again, this is a male. The female is a little bit drabber, but uh, still a nice bird. Uh, but it has the most boring song in the world. It's uh, uh, did it, did it, did it, and that's it. You don't get more from a reed bunting than that, I'm afraid. 